Um, Olivia Branscom is a PhD candidate in the Department of Philosophy at Columbia University. We're very excited to have philosophers with us in addition to lit people today. Uh, her research focuses on the metaphysics of Margaret Cavendish and Anne Conway, especially their views in fundamental ontology and the philosophy of mind. In her dissertation, Olivia argues that reading Cavendish and Conway as panpsychists and vital materialists highlights their contributions to 17th century debates, uh, particularly mind-body problems, while showing their relevance to ongoing conversations in aesthetics, the philosophy of mind, and social philosophy. Uh, Olivia is also an artist and podca the podcast producer, um, and she thinks it's important to take seriously the many ways philosophy happens outside of the prose essay genre. And I hope one of those many ways is uh, the webinar genre, and we're really, really excited to hear from you today, Olivia. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to you, and we would love to hear about this webinar, and then uh, would love to hear your presentation. Thank you so much, Sophie. Should I go ahead and share my screen, or should I just wait until it's time for my presentation? I'll wait till it's time for my presentation. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much to the co-founders and to all of our attendees, and then of course to my wonderful fellow panelists. Um, I'm so happy to be here and I'm so happy to have everybody, to hear from everybody. I think it's gonna be a really fun and um, informative time. So thank you so much. Um, after the co-founders reached out to me about participating in this year's Olios, I wanted to take the opportunity to think about Margaret Cavendish and Anne Conway from a somewhat new to me perspective. So typically I work on their ideas about mind and matter. I also have serious interests in the philosophy of art and I've spent time thinking about Cavendish's views on art and artifice. But for this panel, which I also wanted to be interdisciplinary, I decided to focus on Cavendish's views on women and gender, partly because of a personal interest and partly because this topic encompasses questions and approaches spanning different disciplines. So there are people writing about this in philosophy, literary studies, and history um, in a way that I feel is very fruitful. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity there for conversations to happen um, or to be continued. So in my own case, I became interested in this issue when I started writing about Cavendish's natural philosophy, especially her panpsychism, what I consider to be her panpsychism, as a resource for 21st century environmental thought. Um, while Cavendish's natural philosophy is in so many ways anti-hierarchical, I noticed what seemed to me to be a kind of tension between the potential of her metaphysics on the one hand, and then the things she actually writes about women on the other. Um, and I wanted to know what, if anything, we can learn about her views on gender from looking specifically at her natural philosophy, um, not instead of, but alongside some of her claims about women in human society that arise you know, in her writings about herself, but also in some of her other contributions in different genres. So as you'll hear, I talk a bit about Conway in this presentation as well, but I have a lot of ideas that didn't make it into the final cut just because I wanted to respect everyone's time. So if anyone's interested in discussing this or bringing Conway into the conversation after the panel presentations or just another time, let me know, because I'd love to talk more about that. So that's, where I'm coming from in terms of my interest in this topic for this panel. And then my rationale for inviting my fellow pa panelists was pretty simple. So I just wondered who was thinking about both gender and natural philosophy, or who was working on gender in Cavendish outside of philosophy, but in a way that resonated with me and my philosophical interests, or that seemed sort of recognizably philosophical um, in a sense. So, and I also wanted to bring together people from different stages in their careers, because I think that that's a really exciting aspect of the Olio project. So then I just invited them to take the prompt and run with it. And I'm really looking forward to hearing their presentations. So in my own talk, I acknowledge the need for interdisciplinary work, but also because of time and the need to keep things somewhat concise, my presentation is fairly philosophy oriented. I talk about Cavendish's natural philosophical writings for the most part, and I mostly refer to secondary sources within philosophy. So because of that, I'm delighted that my fellow panelists are taking an expansive approach to the idea that I put to them. And I, I have here in my notes that I think we are all going to learn a lot, but I'll say I know I'm going to learn a lot in this weekend sessions. And I think I'll stop there since I'm the first person to present and 
I don't want to bore you or eat into my own time. All right, so now I will share my screen. And just to confirm, the only thing that's being shared is the PowerPoint, correct? Okay, excellent. All right. When perusing the secondary literature on Cavendish and gender, two tropes come up again and again. The question of whether or not Cavendish was a feminist and the claim that scholars have been divided on this subject. And I think the second claim is true enough. Um, around the 1980s, there seemed to be an explosion of enthusiasm for reading Cavendish as a kind of radical feminist. Um, some people use those that term specifically. But by now that reading seems to be out of fashion or sorry on it. Or who seem want to defend feminists against tractors. And I think that this makes sense. Cavendish's feminist credentials been called into question because of her apparent royalism and general norms, it has a long history of being dismissed, mocked, not taken seriously. To read her mind in her seem worth taking seriously. Those rejections, not even of her views, but It looks like we're just having a few technical issues. Um, hopefully she, yeah, there we go. I'm going to move into a different room where I have a better internet connection. Apologize, everyone. Beauties of technology. Has its affordances and also its Would you like me to take over while you do the shift or? I'm sorry? Would you like me to? be the one who takes on the presentation since you just barely started i could do the first presentation and then you could you could be the second if that that works better for you what do you think i think so i've moved locations i think this oh, okay. should be better um if it happens again why don't we just go to that option so that we don't waste more time but i want to try to keep going but um but yeah if i get kicked out again then laura that would be great thank you okay and Olivia, just for our ease, um, you weren't too far in. So if it's possible to start over, there was a little bit of audio issues. Perfect. I did see the ominous warning that my internet connection was unstable. Okay. All right. I'm in the room with my dogs, so I'm sorry if they make noise. Okay. When perusing the secondary literature on Cavendish and gender, two themes come up again and again. So there's the question of whether or not Cavendish was a feminist and the assertion that scholars have been divided on the subject. And I think that the second claim is true enough. Around the 1980s, there was this great enthusiasm for reading Cavendish as a kind of quote unquote radical feminist. But by now that uncritical reading is out of fashion and in its place are those who tend to debunk Cavendish's feminism or who seem to want to defend Cavendish the feminist against her detractors. And I think this also makes sense because not only have Cavendish's feminist credentials been called into question because of her apparent, apparent royalism and general approval of certain social norms, but she also has a history of being dismissed as a thinker, not taken seriously. And to readers who find in her something worth taking seriously, those rejections, which sometimes feel like they're not even of her views, but are just of her as someone who even has views that we should care to look through, accept or reject at all, can really sting. And the fact also remains that as a prolific writer in the 17th century, Cavendish was an extraordinary woman. So it's therefore completely understandable that we interpreters turn to her as a resource for interesting views about women and might even expect her or wish that she would hold political views more radical than the ones she really seemed to espouse. However, I worry that all this discussion about Cavendish's feminism and even her views on gender more broadly have gotten a little ahead of themselves because Cavendish wrote so much and in so many different genres, 
it's all too easy and it's even practically necessary for reasons of feasibility to pick and choose the several texts that most clearly suit a particular scholar's orientation. And as I said in my introduction, this presentation today is certainly, um, you know, an example of that. And in my own home discipline philosophy, Cavendish's natural philosophical texts are almost always prioritized over her plays and other writings. The work of Karen Detlefson is a notable exception to this. She's argued in several places that Cavendish's plays should be considered equally valuable philosophical sources as her explicitly philosophical writings, as is the very good work that's been done by several philosophers on the blazing world and on Cavendish's poetry. Similarly, while scholars in other disciplines certainly do discuss Cavendish's work in 17th century science, treatments of her putative feminism almost always focus on places where she describes the lives and actions of human women, whether in reference to herself in those philosophical writings, in seeming asides rather than places where actual philosophy is being done, or in works of fiction rather than her metaphysics. I agree with Deborah Boyle um, that, as she wrote in 2013 and 2018, quote, Cavendish's views on gender can be characterized with more precision than scholars have previously thought, particularly by examining Cavendish's natural philosophy, end quote. Since by the end of her career, Cavendish had produced a detailed metaphysical system, that system seems worth probing for its implications regarding gender. Unlike Boyle, who tends to argue that Cavendish is conservative or even negative about women, I suggest that Cavendish's ideas about individuation and non-hierarchical creature-creature relations offer the potential to think expansively about gender, even if Cavendish herself did not endorse doing this. But it's not yet entirely clear in the literature how individuation should be understood in Cavendish, marking an area for fruitful future study. And in the rest of this talk, I want to consider what a gendered subject is for Cavendish, asking along the way what gender is and how individuals get gendered. And I also offer my own tentative suggestion for one way of understanding Cavendish on gender, though, as I suggest, a lot more needs to be done. Okay, so I have here a slide that lists some important elements of Cavendish's philosophy as I see it. And I don't expect people to read through this, but I wanted to have it here in case anything that I mention is unfamiliar to any participants or people want um, a refresher on what I take to be some of the sort of core things going on here that are relevant to the talk that I'm giving. But I'm also just gonna say, um, attempt to summarize what I think are the really, really key things for what I'm gonna present. So in brief, Margaret Cavendish is a materialist about the natural world who suggests that everything in nature, including human minds, is composed of extended material stuff. She also thinks that all the material individuals in nature are rational, perceptive, and self-moving. So there's a quote on here. She says, I conceive of nature to be an infinite body, which by its own self-motion is divided into infinite parts, not single or indivisible parts, but parts of one continued body only discernible from each other by their proper figures caused by the changes of particular motions. Okay, I'm gonna to return to this slide just in case it's needed. Because of her panpsychism, plenism, and rejection of atomism, all features shared with Anne Conway, who I'll discuss briefly as a counterexample in a moment, the question of individuation is complicated for Cavendish. So thinking about plenism, that raises questions about how to draw the boundaries between individuals. You don't have the physical form as the principle of individuation that is there for Aristotelianism because it's not necessarily clear where the boundaries between physical individuals end and begin. Panpsychism, for example, makes it hard to see how infinitely many minded individuals could come together to compose one single individual with a seemingly coherent point of view. So I just mentioned these as examples of different ways that Cavendish's philosophy make individuation specifically the question of how we get the individuals that we interact with in everyday life, but also all the other individuals that she thinks exist. How do we get them metaphysically? How are they formed? Okay, so what do we know about how Cavendish understands individuation? One candidate is found in that quote from observations that I just read, self-motion is supposed to account for individuation. Jumping into gendered implications right away, Detlefson remarks in a 2019 paper that this linkage of individuation and material self-motion suggests the worry that Cavendish might be something of a gender essentialist. 
So I think the thought there is that if mental capacities are linked to the figure and structure of a material body, then it's easy to see how, for example, features of women's bodies that differ from the bodies of men could dictate and limit women's capacities. So Dutlifson quickly challenges this worry by appealing to Cavendish's emphasis on education and its potential to improve women's rational functioning. But I think that Cavendish does sometimes endorse the view that physical differences correspond to limitations in reality. And in an unfortunate passage in Philosophical Letters, she suggests that people of different races are more or less intelligent on the whole because their bodies contain fewer, more or fewer divisions of rational matter. And to be fair, the really racist stuff here seems to come from Hobbes, but nevertheless, um, you know. Okay, so here it sounds like it's the quantity or maybe the <laughs> level of activity. Okay, sorry about that. Here it sounds like it's the quantity or maybe the level of activity of rational matter, not the particular shape of a person's body or the structure of the way that their matter is composed that dictates the relative capacity for reason or their rational ceiling, if you will. So what kinds of physical variations do correspond to variations in rationality, for example? It would seem that, though physical, the relevant differences are not structural. So what I'm trying to suggest is that it seems like rationality varies in accordance with the amount of rational matter, or as I said before, the level of activity of the rational matter. It's, it's a bit difficult to tell from the text. Inherent in the matter composing a particular structure. And I find it interesting and, and important to note that more often than not, Cavendish addresses structural difference, for example, the differences among bees and humans and birds, as sources of non-hierarchical, different but not unequal rational variation. And she even seems to celebrate the different knowledges of different kinds of creatures, and very clearly rejects the notion that human knowledge represents the peak of natural rationality. So here on my slides, they have a quote substantiating this. Um, and this is just one of many, many examples. This anti-hierarchical bent of Cavendish's philosophy is something I find extremely compelling. And it sets her apart from her contemporary and near philosophical neighbor, as I like to think of them, though they were not friends, and Conway. For Conway, who is also a vital materialist, so I argue, and panpsychist, the material form of, for example, a rock, reflects that individual's moral comportment. So like Cavendish, Conway rejects the annihilation of matter and creation, meaning that anything that dies will have its matter recycled into a new creaturely form. For Cavendish, it's not clear what governs this transformation or whether any um, principle of the identity is retained throughout those transformations. We might hear a little bit about this or be able to think productively about this um, during Laura's talk on fame. But for Conway, individuals ascend or descend the great chain of being with humans at the top in accordance with their goodness as judged by God and their rationality and vitality track their place in the hierarchy. So I mentioned Conway here because even though in some respects Conway seems to assign a tremendous amount of resources and potential activity and rationality to things like rocks or things that seem very low in the natural order to us, in a very real sense, we can think of her rock as being less rational than a human being. Well, for Cavendish, she could say that there's an extremely rational rock, which has super active rational matter in it, or a lot of rational matter in it, that's more rational than some dull humans. So it's really quite striking and gives one the sense that Cavendish's metaphysics has the potential for some really radical conclusions. And I think that's part of what motivates this conversation about Cavendish's feminist. However, it is true that Cavendish retained some hierarchies within the human species, as suggested by that passage above. And one of the hierarchies she endorses in the rest of her writings seems to be that between men and women. Men are generally held to be more rational and capable than women, and she thinks they should be treated as such. And even some of her more socially imaginative literary texts can be read as bearing this out. So as our panels, or um, the Olio's co-founder, e. E. Spencer has pointed out in a recent paper on Cavendish and education, 
some of her stories of women behaving in a masculine manner, or at least when it comes to matters of education and intellectual employment, and in death, sudden inexplicable death, or subjugation through safe patriarchal marriage. So the moral seems to be, even if women are capable of going beyond the bounds of their social roles, bad things happen when they do. But I still think, I still have a question. So I'm still exercised by this question of how women are really differentiated from men in Cavendish's opinion. And where in the individuation process does gender become pertinent? What is it that makes one human being have a particular gender in the first place? I considered the possibility that gender is structural, somehow built into certain configurations of self-moving matter. And even if Cavendish were to think this, or one of us as a reader of Cavendish read her this way, it's unclear how the hierarchies that Cavendish endorses could develop off of that understanding of gender. Because as I said, in general, she's full of praise for the various capacities of differently structured individuals. So I'm gonna look at another passage on individuation to try and get clearer. And I'm not going to read this aloud because it's quite a long passage, but what I want to draw our attention to here is first of all, the language of sociability that's throughout this passage. And um, also the significance of knowledge here. Okay, so it seems like this passage is suggesting that knowledge is important for individuation because individuating motions are retained or preserved thanks to the knowledge possessed by the creature's knowledge of the appropriate blueprint, blueprint or structure for it. Um, so might the notion of knowledge help us out here? Uh, Laura Georgescu, one of today's panelists, makes the case for self-knowledge as Cavendish's principle of individuation in a recent paper. And one thing that sets her reading apart is her rejection of the proposal, which we find in Boyle, but comes up in other places. I've even um, repeated it before that self-knowledge amounts to, quote, knowledge of what the bit of matter is currently doing and should be doing. So emphasis on should. This link between self-knowledge and norms, what the bit of matter should do, threatens once again to bring gender essentialism in at the level of individuation. So one nice thing about Laura's proposal is that it allows us to have self-knowledge as a principle of individuation without then building back in this gender essentialism that seemed like it might have threatened to impinge on these more structural theories. Okay, so I have here in other words, according to Laura's reading, self-knowledge doesn't guide one to behave in the manner appropriate to what one is. Instead, it is what marks the boundaries between me and I wrote my chair, but I'm on the couch, or me and my dog when, glad I wrote this one in, I'm begging her with my eyes not to bark in the middle of my presentation. This is not to suggest that norms do not play a significant role in Cavendish's philosophy. On the contrary, as many have rightly emphasized, Cavendish thinks that nature is generally orderly. Let's see, nope. A quote that I have in my text, but which didn't make it onto the slides is quote, nature hath but one law, which is a wise law, to keep infinite matter in order and to keep so much peace as not to disturb the foundation of her government. Nature is not without disorder though. And disorder, which manifests at various levels from disease to war, is actually necessary to produce the infinite variety that nature enjoys. Still, nature's general orderliness suggests that society preserving norms are important to Cavendish. And indeed, as Detlefson points out in the passage just cited exemplifies, Cavendish often uses metaphors of sociality and government to describe nature and natural parts. In different places, she goes as far as to call creatures themselves societies. So when peace is kept and things are going generally well, the corporeal figurative motions of creatures are happening in a regular way. Individuals are stably defined and they relate to one another in peaceful and predictable ways. Insofar as gender is important to the functioning of certain societies, we may in this respect have reason to consider gendered norms as particularly relevant to individuals. But it's not clear that gender needs to be a static part of any individual's identity for Cavendish, or even that it makes sense for it to enter in at the level of identity formation in terms of individuation, except in those kinds of social contexts. 
Okay, so let me put some of this together. The question is something like whether gender is essential at the level of creaturely individuation in Cavendish's view. And I think this is important because we aren't getting the whole picture of her views on women and gender, not that there's only one picture, but maybe I'll say it enriches our picture of her understandings um, of women and gender. If we stay at the level of social description only, the level of social description that's apparent in her plays and other texts. I think these are valuable resources for like not only to learn about Cavendish, but they're valuable philosophical resources in their own right. But Cavendish was also a prolific natural philosopher. And I think that these categories of resources need to be read together. Um, so in other words, I think her metaphysics provides useful information when it comes to understanding her social and political philosophy and vice versa. So my suggestion, which is very much suggestive, not super well fleshed out in this presentation, is that for Cavendish, gender is not an essential aspect of a creature's identity. It doesn't happen or come about as part of the individuation process. Rather, it's in a way socially constructed. Now, this doesn't mean that for Cavendish, gender is not also natural in the sense that for her, artifacts are part of nature. But it leaves room to argue that the social norms around gender are not nature's norms per se. Nature's norms promote orderliness. And in Cavendish's social and historical context, orderliness was promoted by sticking to traditional gender roles. There's a quote from Boyle where, that I think almost illustrates this. So she says, quote, some women may choose to follow nature's norms. Others might choose not to. Women who choose not to follow these norms are acting irregularly and unnaturally. And Cavendish suggests, though this may not be a defect from the perspective of nature as a whole, it is likely to be destructive and dangerous to the society of which the irregularly acting woman is a member." Close quote. But notice here how Boyle continues to characterize the relevant norms with respect to nature, even as she says that transgressing those norms is not bad for nature, but bad for society. So again, there's a sense in which anything artificial is part of nature for Cavendish, but might there be room to understand the relevant norms as being social norms that are also natural rather than sort of the core norms of nature? That's the step that I want to call into question. All right, for reasons mentioned all too briefly above, individuation is a tricky issue for Cavendish and for all monos and panpsychists, depending on how they understand monism. Looking closely at some plausible accounts of individuation in Cavendish suggests though, that gender is not an essential feature of individuals for her. And I hope this talk has raised the possibility that it is not clear or perhaps not fixed where gender happens to individuals for Cavendish perhaps because of the shifting complexities of her ontology. This doesn't answer, nor does it even ask, the question of whether Cavendish is a feminist. I think it's clear from the historical record that she did not advocate for the liberation of women in general, and any account of Cavendish as feminist will turn on tweaking the definition of feminism in amenable ways. Nevertheless, her metaphysics provides the potential for undermining fixed categories of gender identity, and this, it seems to me, is worth taking very seriously indeed. Thank you.